Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Using 3D in Vitro Tumoroids for Personalized Medicine. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Marilena Louisidou, the Deputy Director of the Division of Surgery and Interventional Science, the Head of the Department of Surgical Biotechnology, and the Professor of Cancer Nanotechnology at University College London. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. Now, if any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the end of her presentation. Please join me now in welcoming Marlena Loisidou. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome, Marlena. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present our work on tumoroids. These are three-dimensional in vitro models of cancer, and we use tumoroids to assess disease progression, response to drugs, and also we use tumoroids that we create with patient-derived cells to create a personalized oncology platform. Cancer incidence is rising globally. And the term cancer is an umbrella term that covers more than 200 diseases. One in three or even one in two of us will get cancer in a lifetime. But most of these are solid cancers, the lumps, such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, bowel cancer, and lung cancer. The treatment for solid cancers is excision by surgery. However, 50% of these patients will need extra treatment, adjuvant treatment, to further eradicate their disease. Unfortunately, all these extra treatments, such as chemotherapy and radiotherapy, only have 30% success, which is a very suboptimal outcome. Therefore, there's a need for better models to determine better drugs. We decided to recapitulate solid cancers in the laboratory, which we call tumoroids. And these are basically synthetic 3D cancer mimics. And we believe that this is a robust investigating tool to assess disease progression, evaluate treatments, and optimize patient response. And a vision, really, is to create a platform of tumoroids, which are created with cells from each patient, so we can predict the response to treatment for each patient. So in this talk, what I'd like to do is just describe the methodological development of tumoroids, and then describe specifically how we incorporated patient-derived cells into tumoroids and focus also on one particular step, which is the tissue dissociation that results in cells from patient tissues. And then I will just close with the way forward. So methodological development of tumoroids has been carried out using mostly cell lines to be able to optimize each particular characteristic. We started off by wanting to mimic the composition of the solid cancer. You can see in the biopsy image on the top left, the cancer cells, which are reddish brown, are trying to organize themselves into glands. And they're embedded within stroma, which is connective tissue, which is populated by other non-cancer cells, such as fibroblasts and endothelial cells. To recapitulate this, we decided to create tumoroids in, by combining specific compartments. So a cancer mass, which is encapsulated in a stromal compartment. And we create these using mostly collagen type 1, which is the most abundant protein in the body, in the connective tissue. But we also 
add one more element, we create dense tumoroids because we're very aware that solid cancers are dense tissues and we feel that the biomechanics of the tissue also play a role. To make tumoroids, we use the raft system by Lonza. This system basically is um, comprises absorbers that we can put in different wells and they will take away fluid and create a much stiffer 3D construct. The images at the bottom show the process of creating complex tumoroids. On the top left, you can see that we used 96 well plates where we mixed collagen and cancer cells. And then we applied the raft absorbers to expel the fluid. These rather stiff cancer masses then get put into 20 four well plates which are already filled with the stromal compartment components so that's again collagen one mixed with other cells and you can see that in the middle image in that image you can actually see with the naked eye the difference between the cancer mass we already created and the gelating hydrogel around it which will create the stroma to further compress and expel fluid, we apply bigger absorbers, and we end up with what you see on the, t on the bottom right. Those are tumoroids in 24 well plates, and you can see there's a cancer mass, very clearly delineated, however, it is embedded in the stroma. Tumoroids are similar to cancer tissues. And I demonstrate this by the two images of the paraffin embedded tumoroid on the left that shows that cancer cells are trying to create glands in the cancer mass. And you can see how similar that is to the cancer cells within the bowel cancer biopsy on the right. And that can also be demonstrated a higher magnification and the high magnification images are embedded within the red box. The cancer tissue is the top image and tumoroid issues are the middle and the bottom image. And one of them is a, of a low metastatic potential and the other one is a high metastatic potential. So the point here is to show that the behavior of cancer cells morphologically within a 3D tissue is very similar within tumoroids to those in cancer tissues themselves. So we went through a number of reiterations of tumoroids for a large number of different solid cancers. And the final, more complex tumoroid we tend to use nowadays is demonstrated by this particular pair of images that show a colorectal tumoroid in fluorescence. The Left-hand image shows the cancer mass in green and particularly cancer cells in red that are moving away from the cancer mass into the stromal compartment. Now the stromal compartment itself in these images is populated by endothelial cells in green which have undergone end-to-end -end fusion so they if you like, you could describe them as a primitive vasculature. The stroma in this case is also populated by fibroblasts, but they're not stained by a particular fluorescent stain. And what I would like to draw your attention to is the image to the right. The image to the right again shows red cancer cells moving into the stroma, invading into the stroma. And the Invasive edges have lost the CK20 red staining. You can only see them in blue. And that's really very exciting for us because this is what we see in biopsies from colorectal cancer tissues where very invasive edges lose that particular biomarker. So we're very happy that our tumoroids mimic a lot of what we see in patient tissues.
Now, this type of reiteration of the tumoroid has got a number of modifications in it. For example, we added extra proteins within the stroma, such as laminin or collagen, for etc. And they're the ones that actually are needed for the um, endothelial cells to undergo this morphological change. I'm not going to go through too many details about the tumoroids, apart from to say that we have interrogated um, the way they invade and that by changing different components of the tumoroid or different stiffness and density, we can change the patterns of invasion. I will also say that we can change the complexity of these vascular networks. And what we actually found that was really, really interesting when we compared pairs of cell lines that had a low metastatic potential versus a high metastatic potential, regardless of the cancer type, we seem to get trends of how cells behave in tumoroids. So particularly for vascular networks, the complexity um, is reduced when the cancer cells are of high metastatic potential. And also, the invasion, the rate of invasion, the surface area of invasion is increased in high metastatic potential tumoroids than low metastatic potential tumoroids. And we've also incorporated cancer-associated fibroblast in tumoroids from patients with that particular specific cancer type. So we have noticed that the presence of CAFs, cancer-associated fibroblasts, um, really, really promotes invasion. And that's actually um, expected. The last slide I would like to talk about is just a demonstration how we use tumoroids to uh, show response to drugs. And this particular slide um, has a, a panel of images that show at the top the cancer mass itself. The second row of images shows the junction between the cancer mass and the connective stroma. And the third row of images shows what happens in the stroma itself. So this particular experiment was using kidney tumoroids interrogated for response with pazopanib, which is a drug currently used in the clinic. Now, pazopanib is supposed to be an antiangiogenic drug, but by using the tumoroid platform, we could see how pazopanib exerted its effects both within the cancer mass the cancer invasion, and the stroma itself. So if I may just bring to your attention the images again, you can see on the top panel that the treated tumoroids are distressed compared to the left-hand side image of the control tumoroids. The second panel shows that the invasion from the cancer cell into cancer mass into the stroma is reduced in the treated tumoroids compared to the untreated ones. And the third panel shows that there is catastrophic events in the stroma of the treated tumoroids compare to the untreated tumoroids. In that particular panel, in the untreated tumoroids, you can see cells in red, cells in green, cells, cells in, um, there's probably one more color, but you can see when you compare with the stroma of the treated tumoroids that the whole vascular network is being destroyed and that's expected with pazopanib. I'm now going to go on and describe our attempts at using patient-derived cells to create tumoroids. 
the rate determining step of creating a platform with patient derived cells is to actually have quite a high standard of success for isolating and growing patient derived cells. So we spent about two and a half years with a minimum of 24 samples from tissues of patients that underwent excision of renal carcinomas. And we actually worked out the methodology to achieve more than 70% success. Actually, right now, we're operating about 95% success. So that's actually a really reassuring outcome for us to be able to develop a patient derived tumor platform. I'm not going to go through everything we've done, but we've actually looked at parameters such as enzymatic disaggregation, composition of media, the condition of oxygens, and we also settled on the methodological step of isolating these cells, expanding them in 2D, and then creating 3D tumoroids. The images below is just a snapshot from flow cytometry where we were trying to actually identify the cells we um, isolated from patients. And the top panel just basically shows CA9 expression, which is a biomarker for renal cancer cells, and how the CA9 expression is increasing with a worsening grade of the disease. To be able to interrogate patient-derived tumoroids with the drug of choice, we first optimized all the parameters in tumoroids created from cell lines, in this case, a clear cell renal cell carcinoma cell line. And the images here show how the cells behave within the cancer mass itself. The left image shows a control drug-free tumoroids and the right images shows how the cancer cells were distressed and reduced in numbers after pazopanib administration. The measurable parameters we included in this particular study were first of all cell viability as you can see on the graph to the left, top left, and particularly cell viability um, across the range of the IC50 concentrations that are used in patients. So you can see a 50% uh, death, say starting after 10 micromolar, but maximizing a 20 micromolar concentration. And actually the IC50 in patients is 18 micromolar. So we're using parameters which mimic the clinical scenario. The bottom graph on the left also shows what happens in the cell cycle of these cells. And if you look at the G2 group, you can see that there is a, a histogram that shows rise in cells that enter G2. And that is at 14 micromolar. And that again aligns with the action of pazopanib as we know it. One more parameter we investigated was the production of the EGF. And the results are shown on the bottom right graph. And with increasing con concentration of pazopanib, there is a, a significant reduction in the production of the EGF. And we tested this in tumoroids that we grew for 10 days. And we did this because we wanted the cells to assume as much morphology as would be expected from a mature solid cancer. So having isolated the cells from patients and having maximized and optimized the way we would test tumoroids from, from patient-derived cells, in a clinical scenario, we decided to carry out a, a feasibility and um, acceptability study with a very small number of patients. So we followed a normal trial summary where we consented patients, obviously screened them, and then presented them with acceptability questionnaires 
and ask them to donate tissue to carry out this work in the laboratory. I, and the acceptability questionnaires were quite interesting because when you think about it, you're asking people whether or not they would be happy for us to create a personalized platform that would determine whether or not they were drug responders or no drug responders. And the outcome of that would be if the platforms show that people are not drug responders, then that particular drug would not be available to them. Having said that, I'm not going to go through the answers to this, but most patients we asked were theoretically happy with this scenario. So let me go and concentrate again on the tissue donation. The tissue donation was from uh, just a very small number, 10 or 11 patients. We took this tissue, we isolated cells, we created tumoroids, we let the tumoroids mature for 10 days, and then we applied drug and tested the response from these. And these are our results in a summary slide. So we, I am presenting results from nine patients there because uh, there were um, um, events in the laboratory that in the end stopped us from being able to create humoroids from the, from, from the last patient. The time it took for the cells to grow was between four days and 26 days. And when we had enough cells, we grew tumoroids and let them mature for 10 days. And after that, we treated them with pazoponib for another five days. And the reason I'm actually talking so specifically about the times, the time it took for the cells to grow, to make the tumoroids and test them, is because if a platform like this is going to be applicable in the clinic, it has to be within a certain time window before patients will have to undergo an extra surgery or before they are considered for extra treatment. So we're happy with this timeline. The tests we carried out were viability tests, cell tie to grow, again, VGF production and image analysis. And of course, we're interrogating this for the genetic mutations to ensure that what we grow is equivalent to patient tissues. From that particular slide, you can see that only two of our samples were re strongly responding to pazoponib. One was a weak responder, and the rest of them were non-responders. The images on the bottom show, again, images from the cancer mass itself, and you can see how the treated tumoroid on the right has uh, less cells than the control tumoroid that didn't receive any drug. And those outcomes were corroborated with cell viability measures and others. So we're happy that this type of work is feasible. Obviously, to be able to determine whether or not tumoroids, as we create them in the lab, are equivalent to tissues from the patient, we had to carry out um, genetic profiling. I cannot disclose all the results we have, However, I will say that for the patient-derived renal tumoroids, we created a bespoke panel of genes that are associated with uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And since we haven't um, published this, I apologize, I cannot share all the information. However, just by from that simple table, you can see that we have a minimum of two mutations from the most frequent mutations found in this cancer type for each one of these samples. And of course, um, one of the genes that we had to include is VHL, which is um, a characteristic mutation for this particular cancer type, and also KRAS, which is a downstream effector of the MAP kinase cascade. 
we are currently comparing this to genetic analysis from the patient tissues, and we look forward to uh, sharing our results with this community in the future. So I would now like to focus on um, one of our steps that we think is key to be able to turn tumoroids into platforms that can be used generally within a clinical setting, a clinical diagnostic setting. And that particular test I would like to uh, concentrate on is how to maximize, automate, and um, uh, reduce the time it takes to isolate cells from a donated tissue. Currently, to isolate cells from a patient's tissue, it takes, the whole process takes about four hours. And for this to be done in a laboratory on a regular basis, it has to be really less than an hour. So to take that forward, we've undertaken very recently um, a study where we're actually disaggregating tissues from patients with renal cancer using two methods. The first one is the manual method we optimized. And the second one is by using an automated tissue disaggregator equipment. So if I can bring you to your attention the bottom row of that schematic, what we do is that we have tissue donated by pathology and we use one gram of tissue for this process. To be able to manually disaggregate cells, we take this tissue, we mince it up, and it takes about 20 minutes to mince up uh, one gram of tissue. And then we add a cocktail of enzymes that we've, um, we've optimized for about an hour, and then filter to actually get cells that we can put in culture and then grow. Like I said before, although, um, this schematic shows 20 minutes plus 60 minutes. Actually, the whole process of receiving the tissue, recording the tissue, uh, then doing this, and then putting in culture takes up to four hours. Now, the top part of the schematic shows the process if we use an automated tissue disaggregator. So we have one gram of tissue, we don't mince, we put the bits of tissue inside a bag, if you like, a container, where we actually also place our enzymes, the ones that we optimized. And then we simply place that container in the equipment, in the tissue disaggregator, and we disaggregate for 10 minutes. And that gives us cells that we can put in culture. So what we want to finish is this in this study is a robust comparison between uh, both methods using a minimum of 10 tissues. I'm sure like everybody understands because of the pandemic situation, access to laboratories and actually access to tissues has been uh, reduced. However, we have managed to go back in the lab and access tissues from patients undergoing surgery. And I'm just gonna show you very simply the results from our first two samples. And um, if you look at the first sample, the manual method versus the disaggregator method um, are compared in terms of the total concentration of cells we received from both method, methods and live and dead cells. So for the first sample, the cells we received from the very simple disaggregation method was four and a half million cells, which is much larger than those we received from the manual method, which is 2.4 million cells. Again, in terms of viability live cells versus dead cells, we're getting a viability of 75% percent 
with the automated disaggregation method versus 69% with the manual method. So those are equivalent. If I can go on to sample two, those same parameters seem to be equivalent. So the concentrations of cells derived by the two methods are very similar. And the viability of those cells is again very similar. So just as a snapshot, just from two samples, it looks like the disaggregator, which only takes 10 minutes, yields equal or more cell numbers at this time. And we are delighted and relieved that the viability is actually equivalent or better. However, this is early days, but this is encouraging results. And this slide just shows the images of these cells. And I apologize, these are rather boring images in black and white and grayscale. But what they demonstrate is the cells in culture from the manual disaggregation method and the cells in culture from the automated disaggregator method. And for both sample one and sample two, you can see that the cells are alive, they're viable, they're rich in confluence. And at least for sample one, it appears that uh, there are more cells from the automated disaggregator method than the manual. These cells are still uh, currently in culture and they've almost reached confluence. So we're very much looking forward to being able to create tumoroids out of this and um, test drugs. Not only are we looking forward to creating tumoroids from these patient-derived cells, but also we're taking forward um, genetic investigations to identify again the mutations that are linked to each patient. But this will be carried out in the future. So what I've done is just give a whistleblower presentation of developing the tumoroid model, optimizing a method where we can access patient-derived cells from patients that underwent surgery for kidney cancer to include into the tumoroids. And I focused a little bit on automating one of the key steps in this process, which is the isolation of cells from uh, tissues from the patients. Because as I said at the beginning, our vision is to be able to present this as a robust platform that can be used widely to determine responders and non-responders from cancer patients. What are we doing next? Obviously, we're doing whole genome analysis of cells that we've grown in 2D cells, how they're going to be present in the 3D tumoroids versus the original cancer tissues. And we are in the process of constructing tumoroids to determine drug response. I'm going to stop there, but I would like, first of all, to thank all my collaborators from the tumoroid group that are focusing on this particular study, the optimized automated disaggregation of cells. So Amber Chima, who's the co-inventor of tumoroids with me, Andy Fieber, who's a molecular biologist, Maxine Tran, the consultant surgeon, and um, an invaluable service uh, in the department that provides a robust pathway for collecting these tissues called TAP-B, Tissue Ac Access for Patient Benefit. So Craig McPherson and Armin, Amir Gande from that team. And this work and these images would not have been possible without our excellent postdoc, Taya Bear, and our PhD student, Kelly. And I would like to thank Citiva for their support. And finish with an image and list of the more extended team tumoroid from UCL, collaborators from across the UK and the world, 
and the postdocs and PhDs, without whom this work would not have been presented today. I would like to acknowledge all the hard work and their excellent outcomes. Thank you very much. Operators from across the UK and the world, and the postdocs and PhDs, without whom this work would not have been presented today. Thank you, Marilena. Could you move today. your computer for me? the hard work and their excellent you outcomes. Close that box because you you're playing the video. Perfect. Thank you so much. And welcome Thank to you. the Q&A portion of this webinar. Welcome back, Marilena. It looks like we have some great questions coming in, and I want to encourage our audience and members to go ahead and submit any questions that they have an interest in asking at this time. Our first question coming in is, how do you see the solid tissue isolation process evolving? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, isolating tissue and having a really robust automated way of doing it, of processing tissue into cells and other components is key for all work that uses human material. And um, I'm delighted that there are products, uh, equipment now coming online that actually um, are going to offer this. There is no way we're going to be able to translate any of this preclinical work into clinical platform unless we actually manage to do this. So there's more and more sophistication in the equipment and there's more flexibility on the equipment. But we need to have this in all laboratories that are dealing with human tissues. We need to have a really good equipment to do this. Thank you so much. And Marlena, in what ways will your tumoroids be used to inform cancer research and diagnostics in the future? So this is very much my vision. This is very much our vision. Um, we know that we are not actually delivering the best possible adjuvant treatment to patients with cancer. And we need to have platforms that really give us real answers. And the way we're taking tumoroids forward is that we have designed larger trials where we actually manufacture tumoroids and interrogate them for drug response or non-response. And we uh, look back at the patients and their treatment to be able to identify whether or not the tumoroid responses correspond to the patient responses. And we need about something like 180 patients to get a good answer. So if we have con concordance between the patient responses and the tumoroid responses to the same drug, then that gives a really, really good um, answer on how we're gonna take tumoroids forward. But we really want to develop this into a platform that's going to be widely used and is gonna give real answers for specific patients. And thank you so much. And again, I wanna thank our audience members for these great questions coming in. What have been the main challenges encountered with the tumoroid study to date? Okay, so the greatest challenge, the greatest challenge has been to optimize the isolation and growth of patient-derived cells. When we embarked on this, we had a five-year program and we thought it would not be that difficult to isolate cells from patients. And it's been the huge, the, the most huge stumbling block. It really took us over two years just to optimize cell isolation from patients with kidney cancers. And we started with four different cancer types. We wanted to try it out for prostate cancer, for kidney cancer, for bowel cancer and for lung cancer. So uh, we took forward kidney cancers because we started getting really good results from the original isolations. 
I think that's a that's a, a huge step. I think that for different cancer types, different initial proce processing can take place. For example, if somebody wants to make tumorates with colorectal cancer, it might be that the best methodology to follow would be to create organoids from colorectal cancer and then incorporate them into tumoroids. But um, so, so each cancer type is going to have a different methodological, optimized methodology for that particular step. So I think that's been the greatest, the greatest challenge. Thank you so much. We have time for a couple more questions. How does your approach compare with the genetic profile approach to determining uh, appropriate drugs from each patient? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, this is not competing technology. Genetic profiles or biomarker profiles are incredibly useful. For example, we know that um, take breast cancer, the expression of the receptor HER2 identifies a, a subgroup of patients that would benefit from um, the antibody Herceptin, which is directed against HER2. So having a profile molecular or genetic that identifies those particular biomarkers or aberrated genes, it's incredibly useful. It, it gives you like the first filter for, for stratifying treatment. But if I can follow up with the Herceptin argument, although patients that express HER2 are treated with Herceptin, the patients that benefit from that are less than 50%. So there are other factors that determine the response to the drug. So it could be genetic, it could be epigenetic, it could be environmental. So by creating an organoid or a tumoroid, you actually create the 3D or you try to mimic the 3D positioning of cells and you give them an environment where they can have cues or messages coming to them that are extra to a genetic or molecular profile. So by having a tumoroid platform, then you're gonna, you might get different answers in terms of drug responses to what you would get by profiling the tissues. It could be that in different cancer types, there should be an approach where two such methodologies are combined. You can have both genetic profiling and um, an organoid or a tumoroid platform giving answers. And the only way we're going to figure this out for each specific cancer type is to take forward studies where we compare these different approaches for the same patient and at the same time we try and see uh, compared to what happens when the patient mm -hmm. receives that particular treatment. By taking such studies forward, I think we can isolate and identify what's the best approach to use to determine personalized responses for different cancer types. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. Do you think the passage of the cells through 2D ex expansion will change the phenotype before going back into 3D? Interesting. Yes. That, yeah, that's a really, really good question. And I can see it's Grant. I know Grant Cameron. Hello, Grant. Uh, wonderful to, to, to sort of talk through this platform. Um, yes, that's an excellent question. Um, possibly yes, because 2D expansion, if you, each step in the whole methodology of isolation and growth has the opportunity to change the cells. So taking the cells out from the tissue, 
one assault, putting them into 2D, where they actually grow on a very, very hard plastic and not in the normal sort of orientation that they have in the body. And then going into 3D. Again, you put them into 3D, but that's not necessarily the same 3D as the patient 3D. It tries to mimic the patient 3D, but it doesn't have all the characteristics. So each one of those steps has the opportunity for cells to change in terms of phenotype, and also the opportunity is there for subpopulations of cells to overtake the others. So the mm. short answer is yes. However, the only way we're going to actually identify what's happening is to look at the original tissue, at the cells that have been isolated, at the cells at the end of the 2D expansion, and at the cells that are growing within 3D. And that's the only way that we can actually uh, determine if there have been phenotypic shifts. And that is what we're trying to do right now with the study where we're comparing the uh, disaggregation using the manual method versus the, the disaggregation using the automated method, because that is an absolute key question. Thank you. Marlena, lo easy do. Thank you so much for this presentation today. It was fabulous. Would you like to provide the audience with a closing remark before we go? Wow. Well, I haven't prepared a closing remark. <laughs> I'm really, really uh, honored and I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to present this work. And um, I would like to say that um, the um, developments in this field are very, very exciting. And I think whether or not it's this methodology or other methodologies, that there's going to be some real breakthroughs in the next five to 10 years on how to develop personalized, personalized cancer treatment. Thank you very much. Marilyn, I thank you again for your time today. And I want to thank our audience members for their questions, questions that were not presented today in the Q&A, but were submitted, will be addressed via email. Thanks again, Marlena. And this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing for 12 months. Please remember to share it with your colleagues who may be interested in today's topic. And don't miss out on the other presentations on our agenda. Visit the agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thanks again for your participation. Until next time, stay safe and stay healthy. Take care. Bye-bye.